Hey, everybody. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Hemmings Hot Rod Barbecue Podcast. On this episode, we have Mr. Bradley Brownell, formerly of Radwood and now the director of the Crawford Auto and Aviation Museum in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, known Brad for a long time. One of the nicest guys in the industry. Knowledgeable as all hell. Uh, lover of everything vehicular, whether it flies, rides or drives. And just an all around great dude. So, dude, how you doing today, man? Man, never better. Uh, feeling great. I, I, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm going to get older. You know, it's a, you know, yeah. it is what it is. Age yeah. creaky in the morning and shit, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm in the middle of the transition moving across the country. So I actually, uh, had my last, uh, some people might know me as a writer for Jalopnik. I had my last mm-hmm. press trip with Jalopnik yesterday okay. and, so because with press trips, they fly you wherever you need to go, I just flew to Reno so that I could pick up my 96 BMW GS and ride it back across the country to Cleveland. So that's what's on the docket this weekend. Nice. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it needs an oil change, and apparently the battery's dead from sitting for a while. So I need to get that fixed, and then first thing tomorrow morning, I'm on the road. Dude, that's fantastic. That That's the cool part. So for those out there, Brad is like – Aside from doing Radwood, which was the 80s and 90s car show, Brad is a, is a massive motorcycle fan. Again, massive fan of just anything kind of vehicular. Um, you know, he's kind of moved on from Radwood and is now the director of the Crawford Auto and Aviation Museum. Yeah. And I think that that's such a wild pivot, dude. So why did you, how did you talk to me about, because I'm auto museums are always one, I, one of my favorite things. Yeah. Um, but how did that happen? How did that come about? Um, I'm sure, you know, Myron Vernus. Mm -hmm. No, he is. Yep. Uh, He's a good friend of mine. Um, he posted on Twitter last summer that the uh, museum was looking for a director. And, um, actually this museum was the first museum to do a Radwood, uh, exhibit. So that was how I had heard of them was I did uh, a Radwood exhibit with them in 2018 Okay. And so um, I came and was like a keynote speaker and everything during that event. And we had a grand old time and uh, got to see the collection and got to tour around and see everything. So that was really cool. And um, so when the, when that opportunity came up, I was like, Oh, this is a, this is a really cool potential opportunity. So I sent him a DM and I was like, Hey, what do you think? Do you think that I would be good at this? And he said, yeah, I think you could be. Um, I mean, apply and see what happens. Yeah. So uh, I went into the application, um, you know, I've got uh, my background is I have a degree in advertising. I spent a lot of time in parts sales uh, for mm-hmm. vintage restoration for uh, vintage Porsches. Mm-hmm. Uh, I spent a lot of time writing about cars and bikes and planes and boats and everything. Yep. Um, so they, they liked that I had youthful energy. They liked that I was uh, from outside the museum space so I could bring mm-hmm some you know non uh endemic ideas to the to the to the project and you know they 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 wanted somebody who could update the collection and get it uh back to relevant and yep um you know we've got a huge collection over 200 cars like 50 motorcycles 10 planes i mean it's a giant collection it's one of the biggest in the country and, uh, and standing permanent collection part yeah. of the museum. You know, a lot of museums act on um, uh, loans and, and dis- vehicles on display. So we can actually pull from a giant um, warehouse of, of cars. So, you know, I'm kind of in charge of that. And I'm kind of in charge of figuring out what we need to uh, acquire to add mm-hmm. to the collection yeah. and all of that. So it was kind of, uh, you know, the, the Radwood thing really played to my benefit and, you know, having a big EV background pay, played yep. to my benefit. So it was just, you know, happened to be the right place at the right time. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about the prospect of what we can do. I mean, the museum is great. Um, there hasn't been a, a director for several years. So it's kind okay. of been just like sort of ebbing and flowing, just going with the, the flow a little bit. Sure. So part of, you know, having a central one person director is that I can give it a little direction and point it in the right, right way. So yeah, I'm stoked on it. It's going to be a lot of fun. That That's very, very cool. I think that, you know, 
any time that um, you can place yourself in a space where you can really kind of influence and make a difference on an, an historical um, archive like the museum, yeah. right? Where you can kind right. of adjust the collection and you have, you know, you've been around long enough where you've seen trends come and go and you know what is going to be relevant for the next up teen years, right? Hopefully, uh, yeah. <laughs> even so. But then also, I think a, a huge benefit is that you're also able to realize, okay, well, you know what, maybe these things have been here long enough, we could put them in the back collection and kind of bring some new material in for people mm -hmm. to view and realize that they might not realize, you know, is available or was available. I, I just think that that's such a cool position, Brad. I think that's, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's gonna be awesome. I mean, there's, there's so many things that we can do, you know, I want to, uh, Cleveland is such a car city. Mm -hmm. Everybody there loves cars. I mean, the first day that it's nice weather, it's constant hot rods, convertibles, motorcycles, yeah. they're all out in force yeah. as soon as it's a nice day. So like 60 degrees and above, it's like, bam, everybody's driving. <laughs> so, you know, and, and there's outlets for when the weather is bad, go to a museum, come check out, you know, hang out. Yeah. Some, be a good time. And we're, we're right in the middle of a bunch of stuff. We just got a bunch of funding from the state to revamp the uh, lower floor of the okay. of the museum. So we're we're finished putting the finishing touches on that. Should be reopening this at the end of the summer. Um, so we're gonna have like a big grand reopening kind of thing, and um, just like the the level of stuff that we're able to do is so cool and so exciting. I yeah, I'm kind of speechless. Like I've only been there a week. <laughs> But <laughs> but seeing all the cool things that we're going to be able to do and that we're going to be able to make happen, I'm I'm so excited. Interacting with the community and bringing in people who aren't traditional car museum goers, yeah, and um, bringing in some non-traditional uh, exhibits and working with you know we're right in uh, this area called University Circle and there's like five museums in one area. So there's a natural okay. history museum, an art museum an arboretum, uh, a, um, another, uh, modern art museum. So like mm -hmm. working with those guys and like trying to get some bigger stuff going in the community. I'm, I'm really stoked. And then we have great relationships with, you know, the lane and the Corvette museum and, you know, regional museums in the area, sure. we can do big exhibits with them as well. So, uh, it's just, you know, getting into the position, finding my feet, and uh trying to make a difference uh influence well, the next generation of car enthusiasts is what i hope to do uh dude, well i think you've been doing that for quite some time and i think the museum is <laughs> is ultra lucky to have you on their team at this point i mean oh, I, that's fantastic uh let me ask you this because i know the museum the museum i think was started in in the early 40s if i'm not correct right it's been around a long time yeah but so how is it now because uh, you mentioned you you have automobiles you have motorcycles bicycles scooters i know you've got aircraft there like a p51 mustang and whatnot yeah what yeah. is it like as the director to be able because you know when we go to these museums the general public goes everything is somewhat cordoned off right you could look you sure. can't touch what is it like to be the director and be able to get up close and personal with these machines and really give them what get really give them a once over and look at them in detail how does how has that changed your perspective and I, again no you just started but Sure. That always fascinated me. Well, I think the big thing for me ha has been, you know, a lot of the, a, a huge portion of the collection because it was started so early is brass era, pre-war, mm -hmm. you know, uh, stuff like that, that has, I mean, that stuff's been in museums since my grandparents were kids. Sure. Like, like this is stuff that has been up on a pedestal that I, it's untouchable that I've never been right. able to look at before, you know? So yeah. getting the, the chance to get down and dirty with, some stuff that was built, you know, 50 years before I was born or more, you know, even more than that is so crazy and so cool that, it, you know, because it's been so cordoned off for so long and like part of what I want to do with that collection is to free that up to everybody. Yeah. I want to make these more accessible to show people, you know, how they start, how they run, how they're different from today's cars yep. and, you know, one of the things that I'd like to do probably not this summer, but maybe next summer is uh, as part of university circle, there's uh, something called the oval and it's mm -hmm. this paved oval and there's a big park around it. 
And I'd love to do a summer series where every Saturday we take something out of the museum, run it around the oval for three or four laps. Sure. And, stop it and just show people what the, what the thing is, take them for rides or, you know, make it more hands-on. You know, yeah. I love what, uh, I don't know if you've seen what the Audrain Museum out East is doing with their, yep. their pre-war stuff. You know, they've got the, the um, oh, I always forget what it's called, the something run. But they've, they've got these vintage, you know, pre-1908. That they, yeah, that they take out, they do a massive, like a, like a micro yeah. rally with it. Rally, kind of yeah. Yep. And like 30 miles in one of those cars is kind of the same as like 200 or 300 <laughs> yeah. in a, you know, 80s car. So, right. you know, it, it's an all day thing. So, you know, maybe we've got um, the Cuyahoga National Forest is like right south of Cleveland. Okay. Maybe it's cool to do a run down through the valley and sure. pre-war cars. You know, you're not disturbing traffic. You're in, you know, in some right. cool scenery. And, um, you know, as part of the, the larger entity of the museum. So there's the Crawford is part of the uh, Western Reserve Historical Society, mm -hmm. which is like, They've got five vintage, you know, old school mansions. They've got an old working farm from the teens mm -hmm. they, that still works today, you know, with a, a glass blower and a, um, you know, blacksmith and all that kind of sure. stuff. And, you know, so having all these resources, it's kind of, it kind of feels like a little bit of the Henry Ford. Right. It, sure. It's maybe smaller than that, certainly smaller than that, but it has that same kind of vibe where we've got all of these things that can play on each other to make a bigger experience. Right. And I, um, I think that's, I think that's key. I, I think you're absolutely right in the direction of, of um, going interactive with the general public. Right. Because as a museum piece, you know, they're, they're great to look at. And I think a lot of times people forget that these were actually, they were made for a purpose. They were made to as transportation to get you from point A to point B. And they are mechanical objects. And as we yeah. all know, mechanical objects like to be in motion. They do not like to sit and languish. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a fantastic thing. Do, do you ever think, like when you, I know when I look at cars, it's interesting. Um, I look at stuff and somebody says, well, like when I look at stuff from the 70s, right? To me, for some reason, I, I'm like, that's not that old. It's yeah. like 50 years old. <laughs> Right. right. Like right. when I look at something from like 1975, I was like, well, that's, that's like 43 years old. Like shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah. to me, it's like, I think of that in my head as something that's like 20 years old when 20 years old is something from the early two thousands. Yep. Right. Yeah. So, I still, I still have that for eighties and nineties cars where it's like, Oh yeah. in 87, that's only like 26 years old, but like it's yeah. To, absolutely. Do, do you think that like from a museum perspective and, and with your past doing like the Radwood show and, and having your own personal taste and stuff, do you think the museum would ever feature something like that? Like, could you ever see at some point, like some eighties car being in the museum as an antique, because as now they are, you know, they're obviously becoming very collectible. And yeah. um, do, do you think that's a, a thing that the museum would, would entertain? Absolutely. I mean, we've already got uh you know, not an extensive collection of cars from that era, but we have, you know, Bobby Ray Hall's first uh, IndyCar win car mm -hmm. um, from the 80s. And we've got, you know, a PPG pace car from right. the 80s. And we've got, you know, a few things here and there. We've, we've even got some stuff from the 90s. We've got a, a really, really nice SM95 Mustang convertible. We've got a WS6. Um, oh, wow. Okay. So, you know, those are those are more things that we like take out for cruises or take to sure. car shows and stuff right now, but they're, they're in such nice condition that they probably will be museum pieces one day. Yeah. So, uh, or, and more regularly, you know, and we, like I said, we were the first museum to do a Radwood display. And now that's been done at the lane at the Saratoga. There's yep. stuff like that at the Peterson, you know, it's, it's definitely something that will be, you know, a much bigger, deal in like the concord and museum set in the near right. future i don't think it's going to take that long probably another three or four years oh that's so, cool so we need to be ahead of the curve on that yeah and I, even, I agree even further i think that you know i think nostalgia is speeding up because the world is so fast now things yeah. change so quickly you know my, my generation i was one of the last that like was that grew up before the internet and mm -hmm. then had the internet kind of come on strong sure. in my teen years 
or maybe even a little earlier. And, you know, I had, I, I never had a cell phone until I was in college. I never had, you know, and it would, even then it was a flip phone. So like I, my generation has seen these drastic sea changes in, in not only just everyday uh, yeah. life, but in, I mean, think about how far cars have come since the eighties. Absolutely. You know, that they were just barely starting to do ABS and fuel injection back then. Absolutely. Like, you know, and look at where electric cars have come on in the last, in 10 years. Right. That, I mean, I've got a 2011 Leaf that, you know, I love it, but I paid almost nothing for it. And it's only got a range of like 40 miles. Right. And for, for my purposes, it's fine. And for what I paid for it, it's fine. But if I got that on the dealership floor today, I'd be severely disappointed. <laughs> right. and, and they've come on so quickly in just 10 years of progress that it's like electric cars are normal now. Right. They, you know, they used to be something you really had to worry about. But for the majority of Americans, you know, 300 miles of range, you're only going 25 miles a day, maybe. Mm-hmm. Like, you can easily do a week of travel on one charge and, yeah. you know, go get the groceries and plug it in while you're at the grocery store or whatever. And then it's right. full. So right. there's, it used to be such a huge compromise and now it's, it's definitely, it's definitely less. There's still a compromise there, but it's definitely less. Yeah, and the I, I agree. aspect and that, you know, everything's come on so wildly in the last decade. So I think, I think to your point, yes, there is going to be stuff like that because I think, nostalgia is accelerating so quickly i mean look at what's going on with the market right now you know s2050 oh, grand and and those are it's insane you know, 15 year old cars so yeah yeah nostalgia. well the, the fact it is and it is it is speeding up and it, it's really really interesting because it's you know i mean and evs are, are kind of a great example of that right because it used to be the technology was it was constantly moving but it wasn't moving at such a rapid rate right when yeah. you when you think that you know up until really the the late 80s you used to could still buy cars with carburetors i mean my wagoneer is a 1990 yeah. and that came with a carburetor right yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's so it's been in the last 30 years that we've made this enormous jump in technology in safety in ev production in uh you know, I'm not going to say self-driving, but acceleration. acceleration. I mean, when I you mean, say, I, dude, I look at stuff. I remember in 2001, we had a, had a, um, an E39 M5 BMW M5 at the time. It was the fastest super sedan. You get 400 horsepower, zero to 60 in five seconds. You know, man, I mean, the thing was a beast and now a Camry will do zero to 60 in five seconds. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah. And, and, so you look at that and then you talk about EVs. Well, you could get in an F-150 Lightning and go zero to 60 in three and a half seconds. Yeah. And it's only yeah. going to get faster. I remember, right? you know, 2005, 300 horsepower was a lot. Huge. And, you know, Huge. that was a, that was a Mustang Cobra. That wasn't a G- right. <laughs> right. I know. And, and, you know, in just, you know, 15 years, it's 600, 700 is kind of like the norm for a, you know, Not- Cobra level car. Oh yeah. Not, not yeah. crazy. I mean, let me ask you, I mean, so when you walk through the museum and you see these, these classics, and again, you're talking about brass era, some pre-war stuff and whatnot, and even, you know, thinking about eighties and nineties and, and, and things like that. Do you think the engineers who developed those cars, right? Let's, let's talk, uh, I don't know, between 1930 and 1970, mid seventies, right? Do you think mm-hmm. the engineers could ever have imagined where we are today from a vehicular standpoint with the, I mean, we're talking not not EVs per se. I mean, we can, but talk about digital data, like just screens all over the place and the efficiency levels, which have kind of gone up. Technology has changed. Efficiency, eh, it's getting there, right? Right, right. It's getting there. I haven't Um, haven't really made that a priority. Right, exactly. Um, (laughs) But everything from comfort to safety to things like that. I mean, when you when you talk about anything from uh, like pre-war, you're talking about a car that, God forbid, you hit a curve. Odds are you were breaking a bone in your body because the thing would crumple like a tuna can. Yeah, right? yeah. A lot of our cars have wood wheels, so like, yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> there's no curb rash. It's just wheels gone. <laughs> right. But I mean, do you think the engineers and, and the the builders back then could have ever imagined this? I I doubt it. I mean, maybe into the 70s, you're you're thinking maybe, but even then, it's like they're still still 
for the most part dealing with carburetors you know that i've got a 76 912e fuel injected yeah. but it's yep. like the dumbest fuel injection in the world <laughs> and i mean it's points and distributor it's like it's so simple and right. it basically there's a a trigger wheel on the um, distributor that sends a pulse to the the computer to fire the injector and that's basically all it does is it, it reads how how far open the flapper door is and when it's pulsing to know which injector to fire and how much fuel to give it. So it's like, it's like basically just a level above a carburetor. Right. right. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't think that they could have comprehended the level of computing power that we can do today right. in such a small piece. Cause I mean, they would have needed a computer the size of a room to run an ECU today right so yeah. yeah i don't know i don't think that they could have like really thought of it that that far in the future but i mean maybe some of them could because there were some that were like super far ahead of the curve and they were adding screens to you know inside of cars and they were sure. doing whatever weird stuff with you know one of my favorite things when i was younger about cars was i would look at um old books from from concept cars from detroit oh absolutely in the 60s and 70s and like concept cars were crazy you know in in that they were trying to figure out what the future was without having absolutely any idea what you <laughs> right. know. so you know they were still thinking in in the terms of like the jet age in the 50s yeah. of like oh we're going to be driving planes that have wheels basically right of course and and yeah so things have changed a lot but anyway. so well, let me ask you this. So you're, ta- I mean, you have, um, I'm not going to say eclectic taste, but you have taste that, that really spans decades and decades, right? You, yeah. you like stuff from, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s. I mean, you like, you like everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where I'm, I think a lot, of, yeah. You, I'm you, mostly you, a post-war guy, but I do, I do have some love for, you know, uh, Stutz Bearcat or, mm-hmm. you know, some of that early stuff, especially motorcycles. We've got yeah. a 1908 Indian Model O that is like, so cool so cool yeah so with the with with your specific collection right because i know you dive into electric cars like you said you have a leaf i know at one point you wanted to convert a boxer to ev and do a four-wheel drive and it's sitting right there um, (laughs) on the side of the screen it you know obviously moving across the country has put a damper on working on that thing um but as soon as i find some warehouse space i'm gonna haul it out and keep keep going with that project i don't know when I'll get it done, but uh, especially because I've added like three other ambitious projects on top. Of course. Of it. So, yeah, I'm I'm building a turbocharged BMW K100 uh, track bike at the okay. moment. Okay. That'll be standalone fuel injection. You know the whole the whole thing. Uh, S1000RR shot um, forks. Uh, oh my god. Yeah, the whole whole nine yards. It you know it's a it's a problem. It's a disease. Well, but, it, I mean, it, it is and it isn't. I mean, the fact yeah. is we all... Super right. eclectic tastes. You know, I've got uh, two 944s, a Boxster, a 912E. So I, I do have some Porsche stuff. We just got a Cayenne that I'm doing like overlandy stuff with. Nice. Okay. Um, it's a it's rough. It's a beater. But it'll be a fun little project. Um, I've got uh, four motorcycles, uh, the GS... Uh, live wire yep uh, the k100 and then a honda mb5 two stroke okay. uh single cylinder like scooter 50 cc yep um my wife just got a figaro nissan figaro sure yeah yeah, yeah. uh we we bought but haven't yet picked up an alante a 4.5 liter alante okay so there might be some kind of problem going on here yeah all yeah, right. yeah. So, all right so let's yeah well there might be some kind of problem um what i mean i get it all right you started going i was like well that's not that bad and then we kept going i was like all right this is getting oh, weeds and then we kept going i was like oh <laughs> the audi s6 parked out there yeah and the leaf is parked out there right so right i sold one of the 944s somebody's coming to pick it up tomorrow the leaf i'm giving to a friend uh for his youtube channel okay. um so yeah i'm i'm trying to condense okay and the unfortunate part is we just bought a place with a two-car garage so That's I need rough. to figure that out. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, let me let me ask you this, Brett, because I know like you you're saying you're getting ready to, to go from Reno back to Ohio on your motorcycle on your GS. Yes. 
Yes. And as somebody like I've ridden for over 30 years now, which is kind of terrifying to say. Um, <laughs> so like I'm well-versed the motorcycle space. You recently, you went out and bought a Harley Livewire, which is their EV yes. motorcycle. Yes. Um, and, you know, I have personally, like I've ridden, I've never ridden an EV motorcycle. I've ridden e-bikes all over the place, but never an EV motorcycle. Yeah. So, and I know that you, you loved that bike when you first, I remember reading your reviews of it when you first wrote it. So yeah. what, what prompted you to buy that as a, like you have the GS, but what made you say, you know what? The live wire is that good. And what, it, what are the pros of it? That's what I want to know from a riding perspective. Sure. It got its teeth into me from the minute, like literally 200 feet. I went on the press launch in, I think, 18. Okay. And, I, like, it was one of the first bike launches that I went on, but I ever since, every bike that I've ridden has stacked up against it, and wow. I it, like, doesn't even come close. So, really? yeah, I mean, I, I it's not for everybody, but I love it. It's the seamless power delivery. There's no shifting, so you're, you're just on rip throttle. it and rip it. Yeah. Yep. Um, your left side of your body doesn't do anything because you're not shifting, you're not clutching. Yep. So you're just accelerating, braking with your uh, front brake and then your rear brake is on the right-hand foot. Um, it's the... It isn't silent. People think it's silent, but it's not. Yeah. It's, got, it's got gear whine. It's got uh, okay. electric motor noise. It's got uh, a lot of that. And also just as a commuter as a fun commuter, like it's, you're never in the wrong gear, right. you know, you, you barrel down into a corner and rip the throttle. You're not, you know, bogging down or, or, you know, lighting up the rear tire or locking up. Yep. You, you're always in the right gear. You're never doing anything wrong. And you just kind of like go with the flow and it's, it's, you know, it's a 490 ish pound bike. So it's not a super lightweight, but it's like, right. You know, KTM super Duke or something like it's, yeah, it's, it's close to that. Yeah. yeah. And zero to sixty in three seconds, and it didn't make a lot of sense at the at the original MSRP. It was twenty nine seven ninety nine, right. which was too much for my blood. Right. But they um, relaunched the bike as a as Livewire as its own brand, so it's not a mm -hmm. Harley Livewire anymore. Now it's a Livewire One. Gotcha. And okay. So, and in the process of doing that, they lowered the price to twenty one nine ninety nine. Okay. So, so that helped a lot, but it also yeah. meant that the 2020s that sold at 29 grand are now less than that. Right. So they it tanked the values of the ones that sold in 2020. So I bought one with a thousand miles on it. Uh, still had some residual warranty left. Perfect. For uh, 18,500. Oh, that's beautiful. Perfect. Yeah. And so I figure like you're on average you're looking at for a sport bike that's got that'll do zero to 60 in three seconds you're looking at at least 15 grand yeah sure in today's market so yeah. i'm like okay it's only like three or four grand more than a comparable sport bike and i can go back and forth to work for a dollar like one dollar worth of electricity is all it takes yeah to go 70 80 miles yeah and comparable you know a bike that's similar that that runs on gas is going to be maybe 30 35 miles to the gallon mm -hmm. so you're talking two two to three gallons to get you back and forth to work in one day sure and, and in cleveland you know where you are that's what six oh dude it's i mean we we're paying yeah we're paying 650 a gallon yeah. and like so I'll, I'll give you these 13 dollars to go to work for for one day that that's you know? i mean it's it's a lot I'll, I'll be honest with you i'm not sure how people are doing it right now because yeah. i went uh, I filled up my Bronco and I, yeah, I have an old 96 Bronco and it just so happens to have a factory 33 gallon tank. Well, yeah. you're filling that up yeah. and that's, you're just shy at $200 yeah. to, to fill that up. And I was like, that, that can't be right. And then I started doing the math and I was like, it's totally right. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Yeah. So my little it, brother has a twin tank, uh, 89, uh, oh. 150 oh. that he's like, I had to park it. I just can't. Well, you can't right. When you're, yeah. when you're talking about, you know, for a lot of people, um, if they're commuting, right, you're talking about half a week's wages or whatever they could make, you know, to just yeah. to fill their vehicle. It's, yeah. it's unsustainable. And yeah. that's why I think, you know, when we start talking about electric bikes and EVs and stuff like that, this right now, the, 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 the time frame that we're in, you're going to see a lot of people going, okay, maybe, maybe I should, 
yeah. maybe they make sense and they do make sense. I think you're absolutely right. I think that, yeah. you know, it's interesting. We had a, a press card not that long ago. We had a Maki GT Mustang mm-hmm. and it was, it was, it was simply brilliant. And everybody, oh, it was great. I mean, it was, it was quiet, 300 mile range. It was comfortable. It was fast. It did everything it was supposed to do. The $70,000 price tag. That was a bit rough, right? You know, what's crazy about that is the, the evoke, not evoke the uh, lyric. Mm-hmm. The Cadillac Lyric that just launched it starts at sixty two, yeah. So like the same performance and lower price and like more comfortable than a like. Yep. That seems like a bargain on this market, dude. There's grand. Get one for well, you know, well, and that's the whole thing. And I, I, I have, I don't know for some reason. I, I think it's just like an age thing. I, I have a problem thinking anything should cost over thirty five thousand dollars. So like, I, I look at. I look at new cars and I'm like, that's 70 grand. That's ridiculous. I'm not wealthy. I'm not buying that car. Right. So like I, I, I always go down this rabbit hole of, well, unless it's $35,000, yeah, I don't want it. So then, yeah. then I look at, I start thinking about things like that, the Ford Maverick pickup truck. And I'm like, all right, that, like, makes, that sense. Makes, makes sense. Right. Totally yeah. 40 you know? something miles a gallon on the highway. It was great. Totally. Totally. And so what do you need more truck for? Come on. Oh, well, I know. <laughs> motorcycle in there. You can right, exactly. It's exactly right. So, yeah. all right. So you are, you know, you're going in the director role to Crawford the Aviation Museum. Yes. Um, what do you like? Is this? Do you look at this as something that is a is a kind of a stepping stone job, or is it something that you look at and you say, you know what? I, I think I can make a massive difference here. And I think your age, I think your experience will do that. But like, where do you have a grand vision of where you want to be in automotive or, or do you see yourself kind of spinning out of automotive at some point and going into more of a, a tech side or something like that? I think I'll always be in automotive. I don't think that's ever going to change. Um, you know, I, I try not to think about things of like where it'll get me. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of like go with the flow. Mm-hmm. Um, this particular job, you know, I try, I try not to do anything with just half my ass, you know, sure, uh, if, absolutely. If I'm going into a position like this, I'm, my whole ass is in it. Whole ass. Uh, I agree. Never half ass one thing, whole ass. <laughs> up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so I'm, you know, there's maybe potentially down the road somewhere that it could lead me, but like I could theoretically, if, if things go the way that I want them to, I could theoretically see doing this for the rest of my life. You know, this is one of those positions that feels like I was kind of made for it and it was kind of made for me. Sure. And, um, you know, maybe there's some point where I'll get tired of the weather in Cleveland again and I'll have to, <laughs> you know, pick up and find another place to be. But but for now, you know, it's it's whole last time. Um, we're going at it and we're going at it hard to see what we can build of this thing. You know, there's a solid foundation there. It just needs some direction. And, and hopefully that's what a director will do. So um, I'm, yeah, I'm stoked. I, you know, I want to be more involved with the community and I want to be more involved with the future of educating uh, automotive enthusiast youth. And I want to be more involved with, you know, giving opportunities to people who wouldn't normally have them. You know, one of the, one of the ideas that I have, and this is patented, so nobody steal this. But one of the ideas that I have is um, working with the local art museum and there's a local art college to do an annual art car. Sure. Where, you know, we take something from the collection that isn't necessarily like one of one, you know, it's something that they built a bunch of and it's not going to be particularly missed if it's, if it's gone. Um, And we just hand it over to an art student and say, you know, art college, who's your best student? And they go this, here's our valedictorian or whatever. And you go, okay, blank slate, do whatever you want. Right. And at the end of the year, you know, it does a tour of our museum. It does a tour of the art museums. It goes to maybe other car museums or something out, out in the world. And then when it comes back, clean slate, start over again. Same car. Because right. art, is, art is fleeting. And see what these kids can do sure. with a car as a canvas. And it gives, you know, on our end, selfishly, it gives us a better opportunity for fundraising. It gives us a better mm-hmm. opportunity. And another reason for somebody to come visit the museum and another reason for somebody to to potentially uh, donate to the museum. So, right. um, you know, we're, we're, 
we're looking, I'm looking for ways to get people excited about the collection, to get people in the door, to get people jazzed about cars in general. And, you know, part of that is going to be weeknight cruise-ins. Part of that is going to be interacting with other museums. Part of that's going to be being out and going to our own car shows. You know, right. we have, we have a car, um, it's the 1916 Owen Magnetic. It's okay. the, one of one of the first, if not the first, hybrid drive automotive vehicle uh, oh. from 1916. So it's got a gasoline engine that basically powers a big generator that runs electric motors that power the car. And this thing runs and drives. Right. Wonderful machine. And we're taking it to Pebble Beach this year. It was, it was invited to, to participate at Pebble Beach. So we're going to have it out there. So I've got to find a, a jaunty, uh, you know, 1916 <laughs> outfit to yep. uh, wear on the lawn. But, you know, that, that's one of those things where it gets us an opportunity to, to show off the higher end part of our collection. But we're not going to forget about the stuff that's relatable, the stuff that everyday people can right. see and feel and, and be interested with. So, so we want to showcase everything, you know, the technology, the everything that makes cars, bikes, planes cool. You know, we have a, um, a motorcycle exhibit on right now. Uh, because we were doing the renovation of the lower floor, we spent this whole year with a motorcycle exhibit. So we had, we did one that was six months and then we, we just mm-hmm. picked off another one that was six months uh, called Open Roads. And okay. it's all bikes from collectors and builders in Northeast Ohio. And one of the coolest stories, one thing that I didn't know that I learned by going to our museum was, you know, we have this set of boots. There was this guy in Northeast Ohio that was a trials rider in the 70s. He built his own trials bike. It's got his name on it. Yeah. Uh, it uses mechanicals from another bike, but he built the chassis and the suspension yeah. and all. And he was getting his butt kicked um, by sticks and stones and, and stuff like that. So he's like, I got to come up with a, a better boot solution. Just, just my lower legs yeah. are just beat up. So he calls a mountaineering company and he goes, Hey, you guys build these leather boots for mountaineering. Can you build them to my specifications with metal plating, protective plating yeah. inside that will protect me when I'm doing trials riding? And they said, yeah, sure. No problem. And so they built them and he ended up like selling a ton of them to other competitors. And they're like, Oh, this is a line that we need to figure out. So this uh, European mountaineering company was like, maybe we should start making motorcycles. Yeah, maybe we should do this. Yeah. (laughs) And that company is Alpine Stars. Are they really? Yeah. So we have the first pair of Alpine Stars motorcycle, off-road motorcycle boots at the Crawford right now on display. That's very cool. Stuff like that is just amazing. Yeah. There's stories behind everything. You know, I think... I think some people in the museum world disagree with me on this, but I don't think things are that important. Right. The thing, the thing that's in the museum is not that important. It's the story behind the of co- Always, always. So yeah, it's important to keep it, you know, in good shape and, and on display for many years to come, but only to facilitate telling that story to, you know, if you come in and you just look at a car and you go, Oh, that's neat, but you don't learn anything. We've failed our job. Pointless. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. We've failed our job. Go to a, go to a cars and coffee, go to a car show. Yeah. You can do that any night of the week. If, if we're not educating, if we're not telling people the story, why something is important, why it's in a museum, we've failed our job. Yeah. I, I totally agree that, you know, the, the object is always the catalyst, yeah. right? It, it's the, it's the initial thing that makes you go, huh? And then you have to ask the question of why, how, you know, when, and that's what I love about, that's what I love about, you know, cars, you know, bikes, motorcycles, airplanes, because if you can build something then it's fine, but if you build something and it's never used and it's never, if, if it never facilitates an adventure or a story or something, then it's just an object with no meaning. Right. Um, And I think that that's what, that's my favorite part about vehicles in general. My favorite part about museums to go in and just see um what they strike in you right when you when to, to facilitate the questions that you want to ask about them so mm-hmm. dude that is that is really really cool well 
dude we're coming up on it coming up on an hour man every time i talk to you the time just freaking blazes it's crazy <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. well dude the museum is absolutely beyond lucky to have you i think that they and all of us are going to be looking forward to what you're going to do there i think that's the future for them is very bright um where can everybody find contact info on the museum how to get there and then your own uh contact info if they want to follow you and you know any writings and things like that sure um our website is being updated so it doesn't look great right now but it's the crawford museum.org okay um, or wrhs.org which is western reserve historical society you can find all that information there um we're also on instagram we're working on uh other social medias so look for mm -hmm. us on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, all of that. Okay. We're going to do some cool stuff. Hopefully some educational stuff there. Um, I do occasionally still do some other writing. Uh, I have, I have a, an occasional column at um, Popular Science. Okay. And I still run uh, Flat Sixes, the Porsche blog. So look for stuff there. And then uh, Autopia 2099, my mm -hmm. electric car show, is uh, gathering steam for August 6th in the Bay area. And then December, I'll be there. first weekend of December in Los Angeles. Okay. Uh, so we have two shows this year, uh, presented by Nissan. So check that out. Um, that's Autopia 2099 on Instagram and Twitter or the website, uh, com. So, um, I am available on Twitter and Instagram at plug in hybrid on Instagram and at BC Brownell on Twitter. So awesome. I mean, a lot of things that I just said, but that's all right. I mean, the good part about podcasts and video is this rewind buttons. People go back and listen to them again. Yeah. So that works out great, dude. Thank you so much for coming on the show again. It's always, always Thanks a pleasure. Me. I'm always um, glad to be back. Uh, maybe when we get, uh, we're, we're working on a Hemi car right now. You should come out and drive it when it's done. That's, I'm all in, dude. You know that, you know, that. Original, original 426 car. So yeah. Yep. All in. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, listen, have a nice, wonderful, safe ride back to Ohio on your GS. Thank um, you. Enjoy the scenery. Hopefully the weather cooperates with you. Um, yeah. And for those that are listening and looking for their own vehicle, special vehicles, whether it's a car, mm -hmm. truck, or motorcycle, obviously Hemmings has a massive classified section of twenty five to 30,000 cars, plus kick-ass uh, kick auction. So, like, go check it out and buy something from us because we've got a bunch of stuff. Um, and that's it. Brad, once again, thank you. And uh, we will see everybody next time on the Hemmings Hot Rod Barbecue Podcast. Thanks, man. Thanks for listening, folks. And again, please subscribe to the Hot Rod Barbecue Podcast. If you're on Spotify, check us out there. Subscribe to it on iTunes. And if you are going to go to YouTube, make sure you go to the Hot Rod Barbecue Podcast and uh, hit that subscribe button. And we'll come to you every week. <laughs>